Following the representation of the major museum, we're going to have a presentation led by uh, Dr. Claire Robbins. Um, and Claire is an expert in the question of art and education. And um, it's her 2013 uh, publication interrogates um, the question of artist interventions as a, as a pedagogical me mechanism and methodology within museum context, but also um, in some later parts of the publication towards the question of phenomenologies um, within education and its relationship to museums, um, and, and the question of affect and education, which was then sort of uh, developing as a question within uh, educational discourse, is also addressed um, in this uh, publication. So, we haven't so far actually within this um, seminar series had MD actually address this question directly in terms of the question of pedagogy or of educational um, formations within the question of museum interventionism and we're keen to address the paucity and omission of that discourse. Um, so we're delighted that Claire was able to uh, meet with us um, today. So I'm going to pass on to Claire Robbins. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be here, all of you, um, Jason, uh, Denise, and Shell, whose name turned out to be much easier to pronounce than I'd originally uh, thought. Um, thank you also for inviting me last, last night to um, the uh, uh, Medical Museum to see the work of first-year um, MA students. Um, that was great. Really, really interesting work, and um, really good to hear you talk about that work, and it's been on my mind today. So maybe we can kind of weave some of that in. So um, what I've uh, been asked to do um, is to do a sort of brief overview of the book I wrote in 2013. Uh, so I will try and, I think, talk about how that book came about. Um, and it's important to say that reading your information right at the outset, um, but I was uh, aware that you were asking the question, why are we encountering increased examples of museums engaging with artists to work amidst and from their collections? And of course, this was actually exactly the question that had, that, that had kind of started my research in about 2005, probably. Um, I was starting to notice this very same phenomenon that had been going on for some time, but it seemed to be escalating almost exponentially. Um, you know, loads of museums had had artist interventions. Not only that, I think that um, about that time in 2005, there had also started to be sort of slightly more public recognition of those um, incentives to get artists collaborating with museums. In 1999, Kiniston McShiner curated the museum's muse at, at MoMA, which was a show that I saw, and there'd been um, uh, a quite substantial um, intervention at um, uh, the V&A Serpentine collaboration with curator Lisa Corrin. Um, and uh, so, so a number of things. The Freud Museum, which we heard brilliantly about this, this morning, Freud Museum, you know, had been having these amazing exhibitions, which were really pulling in the visitors. And I think that that's quite an important facet of the why, in some ways, too. Uh, one that sometimes gets left out of things. But Sophie Cow, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I think the Sophie Cow exhibition, the intervention at the Freud Museum by the artist Sophie Cowell, brought in more visitors than they'd ever received since the museum had been open. So there are obviously lots of opportunities and lots of, lots of different reasons why museums have started to collaborate with artists. So this interesting problem also threw up lots of problems, because it's like, well, where do you start within this kind of vast field of different approaches to um, this term of intervention? I have to say, too, that at, at that time, um, in 2005, I was starting to teach on a museums course, so I sort of slipped into this kind of field side, sideways. My background is as a fine artist, and I've moved from teaching in art colleges to teaching in an institute of education with programmes about art education, but also with programmes about museum, museum education in its broadest sense. So I think that, that's kind of important to bear in mind too, about this kind of broad sense of what I might take as educative, or what I might be taking as... The, the term that I use is pedagogic. And I know it's like, it's like a really horrible word, pedagogic. It's such a mouthful. Um, but it, it, it is used you know, for a reason, and it's used because it doesn't mean teaching. 
pedagogy, you know, teaching is an act, but pedagogy is both an act and a discourse. So pedagogy brings with it all that kind of cultural, social, political acknowledgement of what is actually taking place here and what resonances that might have for others. So that, that word's used advisedly here. But so reading at that time um, a text that became quite important, um, published in 1989, but actually in terms of its um, application to museum practices, it was probably kind of really impacting in the mid, um, mid 2000s, uh, mid 1990s, I suppose. And uh, um, uh, that's um, Peter Virgo's The New Museology. And in it, he has a chapter, which I love the title of, it's called The Reticent Object. And Virgo's reticent object is art. He singles it out as a special category that we need to pay attention to in museums because art has suffered, according to Virgo, according to Virgo's arguments, from uh, being neglected in terms of the way that it is mediated for various audiences. So Virgo kind of takes his argument, really, from um, the ways in which art, particularly under the modern period, has been uh, exhibited for visitors, and the expectation that visitors would have this aesthetic experience above and beyond anything else with the artwork, um, uh, and that would need little mediation. So Virgo's, Virgo was concerned with, with information giving, with mediating with audiences, with, with whether museums were presenting themselves as elitist institutions or whether they were reaching out sufficiently to make contact with communities. Um, I was less concerned, really, with, at this time, with how much or how little information art objects, artefacts, or anything else actually really needed. That really wasn't my concern. What I was more concerned about is that artist interventions seem to be contradicting Virgo's claim for the inherent taciturn and unobliging characteristics of the art object. Because what I thought we were actually seeing is the idea of the art object being in itself a form of mediation. The art object, we'll, we'll come back to that because I think objects is, is the wrong term here, but the artwork or the artist's invention actually assuming an interpretive role in gallery spaces between visitor and collection. So this kind of proposes, I guess, the idea of the artwork um, as, a, as an, a, a, an object, an entity um, uh, with agency, able to perform acts which is kind of an interesting uh, position and, of course, um, has subsequently you know, been, been theorised and we have active network theory, we've got theories of effect that help us to understand this notion of a breakdown between this subject-object dichotomy here and the way that um, relations are much more fluid between. Also, I think within this, the idea of art objects is a problem because the kind of artworks that Virgo is likely to be directing his attention to are those autonomous objects, are those objects which um, don't offer a relationship to sight, a response to sight, in the way that so much work since post-1960s has obviously been doing. So in my book, I look very much at the way that artist interventions had grown out of particular traditions within, within fine art practices, how they'd grown out of things like Elisa was talking about this morning, about um, uh, a politically motivated work that draws on kind of collage, bricolage, um, about uh, artists' work that grows out of, really, that grows out of protest as well. Um, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, artists who have intervened in museums like the Liberate Tate um, group without any invitation um, and uh, uh, with a, uh, just slipped in under the wire. So, um, I think too, I mean, it's, but it's interesting because when you start to try and whittle down what you're going to address and what you're going to talk about, you've still got some problems, I think. And I had a bit of a problem at the start thinking, well, should I divide this, talking about the invited interventions and the uninvited on the other hand? Anybody know this piece? It's Juan Capistran, it's called The Breaks, and it was a piece performed in uh, uh, Los Angeles Museum in 2000, uh, of contemporary art in 2001. And uh, what he did is uh, uh, between, the, the breaks refers to the breaks that the guards have who are looking after these spaces. 
And we talked last night about the idea of walking on the floor piece. I think it was yours. Um, but of course, Carl Andre's work, which is what's underfoot here, this is this is uh, Carl Andre work. You can kind of see the squares. I don't know which piece it is, a lead piece. That, uh, and most of the new, you are permitted to walk on, but actually it's quite, it's quite scary doing that, I think, treading across those surfaces. But um, uh, what Capistran did is, is to take a break dancing move every time the guard, guards went out on a break. So he snuck in, did one pose, and then another day he's in doing another one. So you can see they're, they're not taken from the same angle or, as any, or anything, but together they kind of mark this kind of um, continual kind of <coughs> process of, of sort of sneaking in and doing something here. So, interestingly, like this is, of course, it made it quite quickly into the gallery. You know, it became, it became a collected item in its own right. Um, and it's quite interesting thinking about Liberate Tate, actually. I, I, I sort of wonder, well, how long might it be before Liberate Tate is a kind of documented uh, piece shown in, in the gallery? How, the, 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 yeah, the potential for assimilation is, is kind of magically fast for these institutions. So that which has been oppositional, that which has been kind of posed as uninvited and problematic, quite often gets rapidly assimilated into um, the, the, the museum's own kind of purview. So there was that. So, uh, so no, for me, it was uninvited or invited. I, I could see that there, that there, there were commonalities across. But one of the things I, I had got a bit kind of hung up on was the idea of a sort of soft approach and a harder approach. So I, I thought there were approaches to intervening in museums and galleries that I guess uh, didn't so much intervene in the true sense of the word. They were more like a contemporary inclusion. They were more like a visual um, contemporary extra. And in the book, I, I hold up these two examples, perhaps rather unfairly, but I, I hold these two examples up, which one is the, the British artist Andy Goldsworthy, who does a lot of work out in the landscape with kind of tweets, Twitter, um, sand and things. And it, he was part of an exhibition called Time Machine uh, in 1994. That was at the British Museum in London. And he brought in 30 tonnes of sand into the gallery. Um, snaking around the exhibits. And then you've got uh, Kosith, who was mentioned earlier, Joseph. Kosith's um, intervention, a, a curatorial venture with the Brooklyn M Museum, um, which um, addressed um, much more forcefully political and social circumstances in which certain artworks were omitted from collections or not hung. So I sort of started to see kind of differences based on really the definition of what an intervention might be. And it maybe sounds a little bit picky, but I think that the definition of intervention is quite important. Particularly this bit here, an action undertaken in order to change what is happening or might happen in another's affair, especially in order to prevent something undesirable. And I, was, I, I, so, so I thought I'd try to stay with that kind of de definition. And it is a definition that talks about change, but it's also a definition that comes from some kind of possibly ethical, moral kind of position of, of saying there's something wrong here, there's something that could be so much better, there's something of a critical debate needs to be opened up here, rather than everything's lovely but we want to make a kind of brighten things up a bit or have a kind of continuum to the present. So um, I think uh, that helped for me at the time to kind of differentiate what I wrote about and to decide what interventions I was going to pick up on and discuss. Um, because, of course, you know, the field is vast and uh, it seemed to be increasing by the week. So, um, in that last quote about, um, uh, sorry, about artist interventions, the alignment uh, uh, to change in the museum also started to come out as quite a kind of important theme for me. Although I haven't really kind of worked out what I meant by that. I, I, I was thinking that change and signalling change seemed important. But also I think that, you know, inevitably museums are, are subject to change all the time. They're subject to changing in funding, they're subject to changing in how um, they're organised, they're subject, you know, in, in external impositions on the museum, force changes. But also internal changes in the museum um, come with a desire to, to signal those changes often. So I started to think too about how much artist interventions could be associated with notions of um, seeking help with managing change and 
seeking ways of making visible um, desired kind of changes that were already underway. Um, so I was talking to Henry over lunch about this, um, that, that there was a, uh, an intervention which a lot of you may know about, so pardon me speaking about it if a lot of you are really familiar with. But I, I, I knew about it, and I, didn't, I kind of wanted to resist going back to it, but it kept tugging me back. And it's uh, Fred Wilson's Mining the Museum at Maryland Historic Society in Baltimore. And I think it, 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 it's sort of an important example, and you were saying you thought, oh, it's the kind of key intervention, weren't you? It's like this kind of quintessential intervention that everybody wanted to do. And so I, I kind of felt in the end I had to go back and, and look at it a bit, a bit more carefully, look at how it came about, looking at uh, uh, you know, what, it, what it promoted and what its legacy might be. So here's my... Um, photo taken in 2007 when I eventually got to visit um, Maryland Historic Society, which was obviously some time after the event. So uh, Fred Wilson's uh, in, um, uh, intervention had uh, happened many years ago. And in fact, in the intervening time, uh, the Historic Society had actually moved to another premises, so it's another building. But I think what the photo does is kind of give you an idea about what's in the collection. It's not extensively um, furniture painting, but there's a lot of decorative um, arts in there. But perhaps more important than that, um, it's, it was a museum that until the 1980s was a private museum. So it was a members only um, institution, it wasn't open to the public. So, um, uh, and the museum's collection, I mean, you know, who put this together? Whose artefacts are these? Whose stories does this tell? Whose history is this about? It's pretty apparent um, who, who that is. Um, and it's not your average Joe in Baltimore. Um, it's a very elite class of people. It's a very moneyed class of people. I would say it's predominantly a demographic of complete whiteness that actually has created this museum. But Baltimore becomes a public museum. They open their doors to the public, and half their demographic does not share any of that connection. So they're saying, well, how are we going to get people in? How are we going to talk to, how are we going to, talk to people in the communities? Um, and this quote came from the director in 1991. He says, how do we make Chippendale relevant to a child from the projects? I don't know if you, the projects is not a, a regular word in the UK. I don't know if it makes sense here in Sweden, does it? I suppose it's like um, the projects would be like big social housing, but um, in, in some areas, social housing can be absolutely brilliant and very kind of well integrated. But in places like Baltimore, it, it has tended to become a kind of ghetto zones. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's kind of really big divisions um, in Baltimore society. It's quite segregated still today. Um, and those, those segregations are quite palpable. Um, so Maryland Historic Society had what I refer to as quite a difficult collection to work with. Um, simultaneously, they'd been opening up discussions with a contemporary art organisation called The Contemporary. So this was a gallery that was nomadic. Um, it uh, took um, artwork out to a public on the back of a flatback truck. It did all sorts of sort of social engaged work, uh, perhaps ahead of its time. And they had a sort of agenda that they'd like to be working with galleries more, and they'd like to be actually addressing some of the problems in galleries. So they'd already set up a project. They'd chosen an artist, Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson, perhaps important to say, comes from a background of education in museums. And he also worked as a security guard. So I don't think that's um, uh, unimportant in the work that he later went on to produce. He's a black American artist. And when they took him to Baltimore to say, what museum would you like to work with? He chose the Baltimore Historic Society because the very reason he said, well, I look in this collection and I say, where am I? Where am I in this? Where is my history? And so this is very much, I think, um, uh, uh, um, a, a, an intervention that, that kind of unfolded on the back of the notion of hidden histories, on the notion of dominant histories that the museum wants to present in an almost seamless way, um, but still there in a lot of national collections. And, and the idea of there being other histories, other voices to incorporate <coughs> into the museum's narrative. So... Um, uh, so, oh, and perhaps important to say too that um, 
the, the relationship that was brokered between the contemporary as an organisation and Maryland Historic Society as a museum was perhaps quite a, a, an unusual one, quite an important one to iterate. It, 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 they gave Fred Wilson a year to work there. So it was a pretty long period of time. And they gave him an office and they gave him free access to their entire archives. Um, so he had a uh, largest select, and what he produced was a, a curation that was scattered amongst their, their collections, um, which took, um, I guess it's, it's, it, it, it took um, the form of finding our, our items in their um, archives. And, and Wilson has said, which I think is quite a nice quote, what museums put on show says quite a lot about them, but what they don't put on show says even more. And uh, so collecting things from their archive, he discovered um, all sorts of kind of curious things, including a Ku Klux Klan hood, um, a whipping post, um, slave manacles, really kind of quite tough stuff that had, you know, wasn't part of this. And so he started to make these juxtapositions, just to say he started the whole exhibition with this weird item, really curious. It's called a truth globe, and apparently in the end of the 19th century, it was awarded for the truth in advertising. <laughs> so starting, but starting your exhibition with, with, with almost like a question about truth um, set the tone for the rest of the show, I think, um, and what visitors went on to encounter. This is probably quite a kind of a very well-known image from that. And you're all familiar with this. Does people know this as an image? Yeah. Okay. So into and, and this was you know a, a trope that was repeated throughout his curation was to take an item from uh, the archives, the slave manacles, insert them into one of their vitrines, the Propruce silverware, and simply follow that with the uh, label that says metalwork, 1793 to 1880, and that was it. You know, and so maybe to our contemporary eyes there's something slightly clunky about this. Maybe there's something very confrontational that makes us feel uncomfortable about it. Um, I don't know. I think we can maybe discuss some of those things later. But for a number of visitors that went to Maryland Historic Society, it really opened up a kind of, it was a way of visually opening up a narrative that was entirely absent from their collection before that point. Um, the exhibition really split visitors. Some people felt it was appalling, particularly the older generation really hated it. And a lot of younger people thought it was the best thing that had happened and actually discussed the ways in which it encouraged a much more critical um, uh, ability in them to engage with collections. So interdisciplinarity, I think, you know, somebody working with a historic museum, um, since from the 1990s onwards, these things really exploded. And part of the reason they did that was from Fred Wilson's um, uh, Mine in the Museum became a huge success. And not just because it was a good intervention, um, but largely because in the year it took place, in 1992, um, the American uh, Museums Association Conference was held in Baltimore. They took a huge risk working on this exhibition. They made a kind of public display of the inequities that were being promoted through their collection. And when the Museums Association came to town, it was the talk of the town. So everybody wanted to come. So people who hadn't been to the conference wanted to come afterwards. And so the exhibition was extended, and people started to think, hey, this could be a really good way to work with our difficulties in our collection. Many reasons why that could be appealing. Um, again, more things to discuss, I think. But from that point onwards, certainly uh, a huge range of museums started to invite artists to intervene. And um, in the UK, I think, this, this continuation of asking artists in at moments when change happens, or at moments when um, the, the circumstances for working with audiences could do with rethinking in some way or other has become really quite pronounced. So the Hunterian Museum, which I'm sure some of you, I'm uh, sure, uh, at least knows, uh, and, and maybe a few others, um, I'm, I'm showing you this slide just because you can see how tucked away it is. You wouldn't even know there was a museum there. It's in the Royal College of Surgeons, and you have to go up some stairs to get there, and then you open out into this space. It used to look like this, but now it looks like this. So they have this big input of uh, lottery heritage funding, 3.1 million, and um, it transformed itself from, actually the, those images were, were, were at, um, at the museum from 1951, it looks older than the ones before. Um, so they've made what they called a crystal gallery, so this floor-to-ceiling glass uh, cabinets, 
um, but you can see what it contains as a museum. It's the collection of the 18th century surgeon physician John Hunter, um, and uh, within it are a lot of what they refer to as wet preparations, which are these formaldehyde jars um, within which um, you have um, specimens various, um, but quite a lot of human body parts in there. And this, was, this is a collection of where things go wrong, where illness happens. And, uh, and as such, it's actually a pretty tough museum to go into. There's some pretty horrible things in there. Um, uh, and so turning itself around from being a museum that had been for professionals, being totally designed for surgeons to learn into thinking, how do we make this collection relevant and open to the layperson? How do we work with a much more general audience in here? And what are going to be some of the problems that a lay audience are going to face coming into this space? How, how do we work with that? And um, that, so subsequent <coughs> to opening, they've worked a lot with artists. And Lisa's been telling me that this is, this is a really common thing for medical museums. Um, and I know the welcome in London do too, to work with artists to somehow have a, a public presentation of science. And I was going to show you a little clip, if I can, you might have to help me with this, but a little clip from a film by um, Karen Ingham, the artist Karen Ingham, who responded to... Um, the collections. Now, just can I, if I click on this, is it going to go wrong? Should I go? Yeah. Okay. It's down there. That one. Yeah. Thank you. I'll never be able to do this in a million years. <laughs> waiting for Godot, the characters of Estragon and Vladimir share a conversation about the dead. All the dead voices, they make a noise like wings, like leaves, like sand, like leaves. They all speak at once, each one to itself. Rather they whisper, they rustle, they learn. What do they say? They talk about their lives. I too wonder what the dead would say if they could only speak. Would they talk about their lives, or would they tell us of their deaths? The Hunterian Museum at London's Royal College of Surgeons is home to the anatomical collection of 18th century surgeon anatomist John Hunter. Here in the beautifully lit space of the Crystal Gallery are row upon row of preserved anatomical objects. But these objects were once subjects. Numbers once names. All the dead voices. What do they say? Not a sound, not a whisper. Nothing escapes the tortured confines of my diseased throat. Where once there was song, there is now only rasping. Where once there was speech, silence. Where once there was beauty, pain. My young son will never experience the famed delights of his mother's pure, clear, choral range, nor will he hear me speak his name. I cannot even utter the name of my killer, no more than the doctors could halt the all too rapid progress of this dreadful disease. And now I'm enclosed in a world of perpetual silence, my throat opened and displayed for all the world to see. All that is left of me. Not a song. Not a whisper. Oops. Three six four. A larynx and trachea showing changes consistent with tuberculosis. The patient in this case was a twenty nine year old Marion. Fantastic. We'll get back to the Brilliant. Thank you so much. So um I mean Introducing works like that, that add a kind of dimension that's very much to do with working from research from their collections, revealing perhaps what used to be there too. I think it's another interesting aspect of that. There used to be a lot more information on display uh, once, and that's been kind of um, filtered out in the name of this objectivity of looking. 
Um, but, but, but works like this set alongside actually really kind of bring a new dimension for visitors to kind of engaging with some of these, these difficult artefacts. So I think um, uh, that's, that's been <coughs> certainly something that we've seen a, an increase in. And um, another, oh, sorry, I'm just conscious of time, another piece I just want to refer to um, uh, in the same kind of spirit, but a, a very different piece here, I think, um, is um, something that went to the Imperial War Museum in London. Um, and uh, um, as you can see here, um, it's a car um, that has been in a terrible explosion. And um, in fact, it was a car salvaged from um, the bombings in Baghdad in um, 2007, which um, killed 38 civilians in um, the book district of, of Baghdad in a street called um, al Abi Street, which was named after an Iraqi poet. Um, and um, uh, the piece was, the piece of uh, the car was acquired by the artist, the uh, UK artist Jeremy Della, but he, he didn't make it for the Imperial War Museum, he <coughs> intended to go there. In fact, prior um, to arriving at the Imperial War Museum, he'd toured it under a, another name, under, a, under the name It Is What It Is, as part of a, a, a kind of a discursive artwork piece um, touring 13 uh, towns in the, in the US with, um, <coughs> with, with, with um, two, um, two people came with him, um, a war veteran um, from the American army and also an Iraqi refugee and artist. And so the three of them were opening up discussions in each of these towns they went to, and they were using the car as a kind of visual prompt to start these discussions about the nature of war, what was going on, what was going on in American politics. Um, it lasted uh, for, um, I think, something like three weeks. And after those three weeks, he offered up the opportunity to the Imperial War Museum to have this piece. Now, um, Jeremy Della, interestingly, and I think this is another point that might be worth bringing out, never really thought about this object as art. The object itself is not art. He's quite categorical about that. When it first arrived at the um, Imperial War Museum in um, 2010, I think its, it's position in um, the Imperial War Museum's, what they call their large exhibits halls, really significant. This is where visitors come in. So it's almost as if it's the first thing they see when entering. Um, and, and I was particularly um, struck by the, the kind of, um, well, the kind of decision making to place it right here in the large exhibit hall with all these kind of um, articles of, of, of weaponry. I think also the card, the card does something when you come into this space as well. Um, and the first thing that, that, that a lot of people have talked about, and I certainly felt, was the idea of, of encountering something in that space, an alien kind of cannons and aircraft and things that I actually knew about. It was something that I, I felt I understood. I mean, our relationship with cars, love, love them or hate them, but we all have a relationship with cars. It's a human scale, and it's quite difficult not to look at that car without thinking about what it was as well as what it is. And so it brings up all sorts of co kind of senses of, um, uh, engages all sorts of senses about what it feels like to drive a car, what it's like being in a car, my perception of that car, I was um, uh, uh, told how stereotypical this is, but my perception of the car, because it was big and boxy, was it like it was an old Merc from the 1980s. And uh, you know, I, I had a conversation, I interviewed uh, the guy who was in charge of informal learning there, and he went, oh yes, everybody does that. That's like just your stereotypical view of what Iraqis drive. Actually, it was a Volvo. But um, uh, that's sort of incidental. I mean, I think more importantly is the impact that, um, that the staff registered that this insertion into this um, uh, exhibit hall had on visitors. Um, what people wanted to talk about. And um, one of the challenges for people working within the education teams and working with groups, especially young people, is getting people to calm down in here and just sort of think about stuff. I mean, if ever I go in there on a, a weekend, there's just like loads of kind of 10-year-old boys roaring around trying to find the fastest, biggest thing that's there. So getting a focus of attention on something through this juxtaposition of what these machines and um, artefacts can do and what the results of some of this might be is, is really sort of significant for them, the way that it opened up philosophical discourse. Other things that I think have been really important for them is that it's the first exhibit that they've had that talks of civilian deaths in warfare. 
And during the course of the 20th century, right at the outset, civilian deaths were at, a, at about kind of 10% of the population in warfare. At the end of the 20th century, they're up to 90. And the Imperial War Museum really ought to have been addressing the idea of where civilian deaths actually, you know, kind of sits in their museum collection and whether they're able to talk about it or not. I think um, this is an interesting, this is taken straight from their website. The car is now back in London. The Imperial War Museum has now been refurbished after a period of time. And the car is incorporated into a display. But just read the wording on the top, because I think it's, it's quite significant here. Yeah. So it's now just become a car used in. Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of returning, gradually it's returning to the state. Uh, it's no longer a work by Jeremy Dell. Um, one of the things that, that, that Grant Rogers, the informal learning manager, was talking to me about is the kind of perceptions of different groups when they come in to look at this anyway. You know, how people who knew Jeremy Deller and had, uh, who'd come there were looking at it as if it was a work of art. They were wanting to discuss how it fits within a trajectory of, of kind of the ready-made, of conceptual art, or what it does with social engaged practice. People who didn't know anything about Jeremy Deller and didn't know anything about art we're discussing it completely differently. You know, this kind of acknowledgement that objects bring together you know, disparate groups um, in discussions that can be really profitable when you spill them over into each other. But the status of art, I think, is an interesting one in a lot of these interventions. Um, whether it trips people up, whether it gets in the way, whether it's important or not important to ongoing debates. Um, and I just want to end on this kind of quote, I think, which is, which is kind of an important one for me in terms of how we might regard the work that artists do in museums, that artists are presentative effects. They not only create them in their work, but they give them to us and make us become with them. Um, and I think there's something quite resonant about the way that artists work in interventions. is always in relation to, always a part of, and always um, uh, uh, hoping for uh, discursive solutions somehow. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I almost kept within time Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll take a couple of questions for Claire before we move on to Henrik's um, presentation and presenting urgently would like to ask Claire. Yes, um, I was thinking these artists you have mentioned, do you think that do they change things at museums do, or are they just a temporary thing happening in a way of the museum to work with difficult questions perhaps? Or do you see that they do some permanent changes into cultural yeah, I mean, there are two examples that I tried to sh that I showed there. I kind of tried to, to sort of say different ways in which I think things have been changed. I mean, since the Jeremy Della Car came, they are now kind of sectioning off and acknowledging the idea of civilian deaths. Mm -hmm. You could say maybe they were on the road to do that, and you know it wouldn't have been too long till that happened anyway. But it certainly speeded up that process, and it certainly gave them some things to think about there. Uh, but something like Fred Wilson's, I think, is a much more complex um, uh, answers needed because, in a sense, yes, it did change things. It changed things in terms of a lot of museums wanting artist interventions. What it actually changed in Maryland Historic Society, I'm a bit more sceptical about, I have to say. Um, they have retained a, a strong relationship with George Siskel, who was the director of the Contemporary and got Fred Wilson in to work with them. He's now um, the director of an MFA course in curating at MICA. And he's worked with his students on curatorial projects in the Baltimore Historic Society. So they still have a kind of commitment to work with kind of interventionist approaches, but they have a very um, conservative trustee um, body that is actually preventing quite a lot of more interesting and radical approaches they'd like to take taking place. <coughs> so from my discussions with them, I felt there was a compromise there still. And uh, to be honest, the time that I spent in that museum, I was really mm, not overwhelmed by the kind of um, ability of something like that to open up that museum to a different demographic. I mean, they've got the Reginald F. Lewis 
um, museum of um, African American culture just down the road, and that is like you know zinging. There's loads of people in there. It's got a really different feel to it. But that collection in Maryland Historic Society isn't easy. So yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it can be possible, um, but sometimes you know those changes can be quite small. And sometimes all that's needed is a is a moment of difference as well. I don't think we want to sort of lay too much on the artist intervention to solve everything. <laughs>